So that's on. It's quite comfy here, isn't it? Yeah. This is my favourite place in the world. Sitting on my couch, looking at the view, having a coffee. Well, that's what we're... Is that a coffee? Yeah. You can drink coffee at 3.30. Not normally, but I am today. Am I that boring that you've got? <laughs> <laughs> now, we're away. Anna, I tricked you. The button's on. The red light's on. Um, Anna Rubenstein, welcome to the Regenerative Journey and welcome to the veranda here at your farm, just out of Mullumbimby. Uh, overlooking, and you've, you've already done my job, really. You've, you've already told me this is a wonderful place, and it is. We're overlooking some... What, what, what's the range out there? Has that got a name? Well, th it's the pocket over there. So we've got Main Arm Road, and then the pocket, and way over the hill is actually Moolumba. I'll show, I'll show the viewers if I don't bugger this up. That's what we're looking at there. Pretty cool, eh? It's quite, <clears throat> I won't step out there, but it's a bit of a drop. Yeah. It's steepish. You yep. can walk it. You don't have to abseil down it. But when, we're going to get to what happened due to the steepness of this area. Well, a couple of months ago, Anna. Um, so, mate, what, tell me... <clears throat> Tell me, um, why is this? Why, why, why is it so special to you? Are they are those cans all right? Yep, they're good. Uh, <coughs> why it's so special? I just, well, I love being on the land. I grew up in the city. I grew up in Melbourne, and, and I knew from a young age that I was not going to stay in the city. And I moved up to the Byron Bay area as a young doctor in 1992, just starting out on my career, and uh, it was just a transformative experience to move to a place and uh, where, where healing was looked at as more than just giving someone a prescription and a tablet. And um, uh, then I bought some land in 2000 and I was fortunate to buy it at, you know, at a good time. It was 150 acres where uh, there was nothing on it. And I just, you know, having trees and planting things and eating fruit and veggies from my own gardens. It's just a different sport. And I think, you know, I've had this land 20 years, 22 years now, and I have such a strong connection to it. And I think, oh my God, imagine 60,000 years. You know, imagine land where your, your ancestors are buried and where there's a story about every rock and every big tree. And, you know, it, it, it's a powerful thing. And can you, oh, you've sort of explained what, what we're, <clears throat> why here though? Like, what, I mean, because you could have you could have bought a spot down in um, Myokum on the flats there, or in I don't know other places. This is this is not not inaccessible, but it's you know there's a bit of a high, bit of a you know bit of incline to get up here. It's high, a lot of rain. You can't just poodle down the road to the shops. Why why, why here? Well, I first came up to this area uh, when I was 21. I hitchhiked up in 1994 from Melbourne and had quite an adventure. And I came and visited one of my aunties who was one of the original hippies and came up in the early 70s and lives right in Upper Main Arm. And she was living in a half-built house with no front wall. And I was a very green 21-year-old. And it was just the most special, beautiful place I'd ever seen. It was right in the forest. There were creeks running by. We, I ate organic food for the first time in my life, which was just delicious. And there were people living in yurts and buses and mud brick houses <laughs> and, you know. Tie-dyed T-shirts. Tie-dyed T-shirts and girls with blonde ringlet hair riding around on horses. And I was just like, <laughs> well, I'm in the Garden of Eden. I want to come and live here. <laughs> and I knew... I didn't want to live on a block that was sort of had been, you know, stripped bare and was just a paddock. I, 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 and, I, and the other thing is, I used to have this dream when I was a kid about waking up in the trees. And, and sometimes I wake up here and, you know, we are level with the trees here. Mm. And it's like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm in that place. Mm. And you then, of course, there's a whole story about how the land came and when it came, and it was just, it's, it's where I'm supposed to be. I genuinely believe that. Um, it is a wonderful place, and I've been here a few times now, and we'll get to, uh, there's one occasion I was here with Lilla, which we'll get to as sort of part of what you do and your, your institute. Um, and let's go back, you've sort of given us a bit of a, you've jumped jumped a couple of decades into your life how and as is the name of the of the podcast uh, the regenerative journey you know I dig deep into the well, as deep as you can go as you're willing to go you're feeling courageous today that, that's why I'm having the coffee that you asked me about actually it's like, <laughs> let's just go there Charlie he's putting some lead in his pencil uh, so 
let's go back as far as you, like, you know you've always you've already mentioned you, you grew up in the city like what what was early days um, your life where where you're in Melbourne Melbourne was home yep I grew up in Melbourne I went to a little like family school until grade six where there were like I think there was about 12 kids in my class and you know 70 or 80 kids in the whole school Urban, then, urban, uh, urban sort of situation. Yep, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. Just one of those little schools that probably don't exist much anymore. Yeah. And and then I actually won a scholarship to one of the biggest boys' schools in uh, called Melbourne Grammar. It was a really exclusive school, and my mum sent me along to do the scholarship. She, she thought it'd be good practice for me in something or other. And there were kids from all over Australia, and I won it. And so I ended up going to this school for the next six years which was an all-boys school with 300 kids in every year, and it was really quite a traumatic experience. In secondary school? Secondary yeah. school, yeah. It was very alpha-based and, uh, you know, all that stuff they talk about with toxic masculinity and everything. This was the place. And I struggled in that time. And back then, there was no well-being program and no one went to the counsellor and I probably had ADHD to some extent and bit of depression but there's no way I ever talked to anyone about it you just got on, with, got on with it and did it but I was just not happy at school and and I, and I knew that and I just wanted to get out of there and, and I, for me school was like being in prison and I remember the day I walked out of my last year 12 exam and I said to myself life is never going to be the same and it's going to be significantly better. And you stuck it out though. You did your six years. I did my six years. I got into medicine, but was then it, I was, was sorry. Was there was there a feeling of obligation? You won the scholarship. Were were were, were family sort of going? Gee, you got to stick this out. Did they even know you were having a hard time? Oh no, they definitely didn't know. I mean, I consider that from the age of fourteen, I had two lives: one that my parents knew about, and one they didn't know about. And and we just didn't talk about that stuff. Um, and stick it out. Look, I did not think there was any choice. I mean, one of my big regrets is that I never s played hooky. I never missed a single day of school. I went every single day. And I speak to people who skip days and went to the beach and went somewhere and I go, wow, I just never thought that was an option. And then I speak to other people who got to choose if they didn't like their school to leave and go to another school. And, and for me, that was just not an option. And, and I do come from a very academic family my father's a doctor, my mother's a biochemist, there's, you know, not finishing school, not going to university was just not an option. But then, the year after school, I actually went on a leadership course in Israel for a year. And there were 180 kids my age from all over the world, different groups. Uh, I was with the Australian groups, and there were groups from Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, South Africa, New Zealand, all over. I actually left the Australian group after two days and moved in with the Brazilian group, just a no-brainer, and um, learned they're, Portuguese. They're, they're as, better looking. Oh, just more girls. fun, just more fun. It was just like they were alive. Yeah. And um, that was the first time in my life where I felt I could be who I wanted to be rather than who I sort of thought I was supposed to try to be. So that was a very, very influential year for me. And I, and I just, I ate it up, I just loved it. And then I came back and I actually wanted to do journalism. And I was a good writer. And, and my father said to me, look, you know, once you drop out of medicine, you'll never get back in again. So do it for a year and see how you go. So I started medicine and uh, as well as medicine, you had to choose one other subject and I did philosophy of religion and that was extraordinary in itself. But then also doing anatomy and learning about how the body works, I was just astonished by um, being able to understand how it works right down to a molecular level. It was really incredible. And, and I, you know, in medicine, you do three years about learning everything about how the body works and how it functions and how it develops. And then the next three years is everything that can go wrong. And uh, it, it was really quite extraordinary. And, you know, sort of jumping ahead a bit, I did leave medicine, but my time as a doctor, I consider was a privilege. I think medicine is actually a noble profession. The problem is the system. The system is based now around, you know, there's too much emphasis on making money and, and volume. 
rather than patient care and love. So that probably led to my leaving medicine, but in the years that I did it, I had an extraordinary insight and window into people's lives. I did 10 years as a general practitioner and people would come in and tell me their stories and I would just be astonished, like what they would tell me about their lives and, and the twists and turns and the things that had happened was incredible, especially the older people, I loved listening to them. Were you prepared for any of that? <clears throat> as in, in the, the six years of training, was there sort of, I don't know, I would call it psychology or? Not at all, not at all prepared. They don't teach us anything about actual human relations, or they didn't then. They don't teach you anything about business. They don't teach anything about social skills. I mean, you know, who hasn't been to a doctor and come away and said, that person shouldn't be a doctor? <laughs> you know, basically people do medicine because they get the mark. Yeah. You know, not because they are the, you know, they have that passion. You know, I, I'm lucky, I believe that I have medicine in my hands my father, my brother, my uncles, I, I actually, you know, I, I could tell when a patient came in if they were not well. Like I also did 15 years in emergency medicine and I might see 50, 60, 100 people in a day, but I actually only needed to identify two or three of them who really needed to be seen and I could do that. You know, medicine sort of came to me naturally. Building, carpentry, music, don't come to me naturally. I'd love to do those things, but medicine was just something I, I knew how to do. So I loved it. And then, you know, and we'll talk about it later. I think what I'm doing is still medicine, except now I'm, now the two things I like is now I'm out of the system and focusing more on prevention rather than cure. I became very frustrated that we let people do all these things, eat the wrong foods, live the wrong lifestyles, take the wrong everything and then we try and keep them alive rather than actually getting in early and doing what we could to make sure that they had actually healthy lives. I'm worried about that cup there. Right? If that spills on your, <coughs> gets wet in your dairy, are you okay with that? Fine, you, you're it's not going to spill. You do that the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> checking, I, was just, I had, a, had an image of you jumping up going, oh, that's a I can wet, tell you have a time. four and a half year old at home. <laughs> that's it. So tell me about, I mean, we, we've got to the crux of it, which is wonderful. You know, so it was in your genes somewhat, the, the, I guess with, with your, your parents and their sort of medical backgrounds and experience, but you said it was in your hands. Is, is it, do you think it's genetic as in you were just sort of predisposed to wanting that? Or was there, was there something more innate? Was there kind of a, I don't know, not, not like a, not well, maybe, or not necessarily a past life kind of, urge but was it was there something else on top of that like a, like a not just a curiosity but something that was like this is my purpose in life not just I'm good at it great question Charlie I don't normally get asked this sort of stuff on podcasts it's actually a great relief I normally it's down the same point, thing. Of, point of difference man. yeah which is fantastic <laughs> I love it uh, look, I, I think it's a series of things um, I think first of all I grew up around medicine so my father used to be a general practitioner. And so, you know, it would, I'd spent time in hospitals, I'd spent time in the surgery. And so, you know, it's like a mechanics kid who grows up around the garage and can just fix up cars. So, so there's something there. Uh, I also think it's very underrated how much real medicine is about human connection. And I, I think that that's, yeah. And, and, and even what you said about this is my purpose, I, I actually didn't feel like it was my purpose. I feel, and especially in retrospect, it was a major step on the way to my purpose. But I can clearly remember through my teens and early 20s seeing what do I wanna do? What do I wanna do when I grow up? And, and, and I really didn't know. And I very much wanted to keep my options open my big fear was being railroaded or moving into something where I specialized and I was gonna be stuck doing that for the rest of my life and doing the same thing over and over again. And so I really wanted to keep my options open. And even when I started as a doctor, I was happy to be a general practitioner uh, because then I, I you know, had a Bachelor of Medicine, I had a Bachelor of Surgery, and it just meant I could do all of these different things. I didn't wanna become you know, an orthopedic surgeon or a, 
you know, a specialist because I thought, wow, just having to do the same thing forever for the rest of my life, that's like, for me, one of the worst options I could think of. Um, and it wasn't until I got into what I do now, this is the time when I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and it was the same coming and moving up here. When I, when I came to this area, it was like, this is where I wanna live. You know, when I was in Melbourne, I remember walking along with a couple of my mates at 15 and saying, I'm not gonna stay in Melbourne, I know I'm gonna leave. And them saying, oh really, we're, we're staying here. And those guys are in Melbourne and I just knew it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the place for me. And I moved around to a lot of different places and it was when I came up here, initially I came to Byron Bay. I thought I wanted to live in Byron. And I was with my wife and young child and we drove into Byron and said, no, this is a tourist town, don't want to be here. And that was when we came to Mullumbimby and started looking around in the hills. And um, that was when I really fell in love and, and knew this, this is my place, this is my home. <clears throat> Before we keep going in that direction, <clears throat> any, any other sort of things of your childhood, you know, pre-medicine or even, or even within that six year window of medicine that were like some sort of real turning points or lessons that, that you know, probably more like life lessons that you remember were, were significant. You know, it was a conversation with someone, a, you know, a book you read, a, um, I don't know, anything that kind of helped sort of yep. hone your, well, the direction you were heading? Well, there were a couple of things. Uh, my father was a very hard working man, a doctor. And, and you know, born 1929 before the war, and so his whole thing was work, provi provide for the family. That's what you do. And he was very abs. You know, I never had conversations about life with him. And 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 from about 13, 14, I realised that if I asked him any questions, he would give me the answer, but it'd be like a lecture that would take anywhere up to a couple of hours. So unfortunately, I really stopped communicating with my father from about that age, which was a big shame. Uh, and with my mother, my mother uh, unfortunately uh, was got sick when I was about 12, 13, at a really influential time. And, um, and so that was very challenging in our family. Um, and so I was really quite lonely during my teenage years. But my mother's best friend, her husband was a fisherman. And he used to take me out fishing in the boat and that was very, very important and influential for me because we'd go out there and he'd just talk to me and he was, he was quite, a, quite a guy. You know, he's a bit of a gambler and a bit of a drinker and you know, he had some pretty <laughs> wild stories. Pirate. And, yeah, I'd just <coughs> sit there for hours and listen and be fascinated and I could ask him any questions. And the best of all was when he would take me at night mm. and would go for snapper or the bigger fish or whatever. And that was just like, I, I, I worshipped this man who I, I later realized was actually a mentor for me and just treated me like a person. Um, that, was, that was very special. And then the other thing uh, that was very influential was in my, uh, just before my last year of medicine, I went overseas to my brother's wedding and actually fell in love with a, an older woman who became the, the, the mother of my two children and it was very controversial and it all happened very quickly and it was like sort of a scandal in the family. And um, that, that had a very big influence on me because I thought that love trumps everything. And I still believe that, but in a different way. And I was, I was incredibly shocked that my, for my family and even my friends my being in love was not considered enough. And I lost the support of my family and friends. And that was a very wounding and damaging period and definitely influenced my moving away as quickly as I did once I graduated from medical school. And it was just incredibly badly handled, which is a big shame. You know, the, the first grandchild coming along resolved a lot of that because my parents fell in love with Jarrah the moment they saw him. But even so, there was damage that was done. And um, I, I 
took me a long time to sort of reconcile that and then when I started getting involved in some men's work and listening to some old stories and different things um, that that was when I was able to sort of understand more about what happened and also more about how it could have been done so differently <coughs> excuse me what was it about did you feel that like they didn't trust you to judge you know to make those decisions or you know what what, what kind of because we don't know, well, you kind of have an insight into what they thought and maybe why, but for you, what what was the hard bit for you that was like, you know, I'm a grown man, I can make my own decisions. Um, was there some some was there something in there that, you know, you got offended? At, were you offended that they didn't, that they were offended sort of thing? Or maybe offended wasn't, isn't the right word, but what, what was it that, that really struck you as... Well, look, there's a Difficult. big dose of naivety <coughs> thrown into this whole thing, from probably from everyone. You were age, what, 20? 20, 25. 25. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Which doesn't sound that young, no, but it was, I was young. At 25, you know, I was, that was young. Well, I was young anyway. And I just expected that when I fell in love with the woman who I chose to, fit, to fall in love with, that everybody else would just say, oh, fantastic, we're so happy for you. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she was six years older than me and had been married before and uh, you know I come from a Jewish family and she was not Jewish and I just thought none of those things would matter but they to my family and friends they all mattered and um, you know I and I also didn't realize that one of the things as a man is that you need to make a choice between your woman and basically everybody else um, and uh, it was some years later I heard an African story that they tell their boys when they go through their initiations when they go through the rites of passage and it's called lizard in the fire and the the end part of the story is that the boy who has uh, laid with a maiden has to then choose between the maiden and family and you can't go one way or the other because in the story whichever you choose the other one dies and the correct answer is you're supposed to choose your woman you stick by your woman first because if you don't you end up as a man mm. who is still <laughs> deferring to his Excuse mother me. and is still being dominated by his father you know which is exactly what we see in in so many families you know grown men still looking for the acknowledgement of their fathers and still you know asking their mum basic questions about life and and sort of going behind the back of their woman you know whatever it is and and when i heard that story that had a i was like how was i not told that growing up how did i get to that age and i also remember at that time feeling completely alone and I used to say, I feel like I'm being torn by wild horses and I've got, you know, my, my you know, the one lot of wild horses are for my, 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 the woman who I love and who I'm now pregnant with and the other lot of wild horses are, are for family and I'm being ripped apart. Why do I have to choose? And there was only a number of years later that I realized you do have to choose and it's in the choosing that everything settles. Whereas if you try to keep everyone happy and do what everybody wants, you know, it's not going to happen and you actually risk losing everything. And I guess, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you choose your parents, you know, in that position, you, you're forced to somewhat, then the resentment is your, your, your bed partner for the rest of, the, the rest of your life, isn't it? You know, the, res like the relationship, you, you basically ruin both relationships. Yeah, many, many things. I mean, how many people do we know who marry someone and, and one or both of their parents think that the partner's not good enough and, and the issue that that creates forever? Um, and unfortunately, that relationship did eventually break down. And I remember when I got into my next serious relationship and it was actually my mother who started saying something about the woman who I was with. And I said, Mum, this woman is going to be my wife. And if you want to be in our lives, you need to accept her. And if you don't, it's going to be a big problem. And, and my mother loved that woman. And, you know, until her dying day was asking me how, 
how she's going and what's happening with her and you know it just was a completely different outcome because my mother knew I'd made a choice this is going to be my my future wife and if my mother wanted to be uh, you know involved then she was going to accept her she had to accept her because it's my wife mm -hmm. so that was <clears throat> just so I'm, I'm i'm clear that was a that was so you're the the wife of your or the mother of your your boys or, the, or one boy the, no the mother of my two boys yeah was the first woman That's who right. I referred to. Yeah. And, 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 and we basically, you know, we kind of left the family for a number of years. Yeah. And, and my, the woman who was my first wife, sorry, it gets a bit embarrassingly complex here. No, uh, no, no. The, no, the, the mother who was, the, of my, who was my first wife and the mother of my children, mm. she was furious. She was devastated around having not been ex accepted and being considered not good enough. Totally. And she just wanted to get out of there and wanted me to come with her, which, which, which I did. And we moved up here together. And, you know, as I say, it didn't work out. Um, and, you know, whether it would have, if it had been managed differently or not, or we were just too different, I, I, you know, we never know. But it was just, as I say, not handled well. And, and it just really taught me in, in future relationships that, you know, your partner needs to be prioritised. <clears throat> you don't hear people say that often, do you? I mean, I guess I'm, you know, I don't have this conversation with people often, but it's it's um, it's as you say, it's we know people who um, it's torn families apart. Yeah, many, many, many. Either way, going either way, I'll choose my woman and parents a goodbye. You know, don't I know you? And then the other way, well, woman says goodbye, and you you, you sort of. As I said, you, you, there's that. Uh, I, I imagine it hasn't happened to me, but it means that that sense of, of resentment and like, oh well. And then it's like, well, I'm here. Well, I might as well listen to my mum and dad. And then, then as you say, there's this, you know, um, under their wing, and then that's not good for anyone. Yeah. Well, look, we don't get relationship skills and education growing up. I didn't get any training in relationship skills, in emotional intelligence, in any of that stuff. So, you know, I, I got to my early 20s when I started having serious relationships and I feel like I had no skills at all and I was kind of trying to work it out as I was going. And then I think this happens through life. We get become parents and so many parents don't actually have any idea and they're just trying to work it out. And some do it well and some do it disastrously. And, you know, I guess, you know, what I'm passionate about now is how can we be imparting those skills to our children as they're growing up. And, and not it's not by lecturing them and by giving them rules. It's by actually letting them hear our stories and work it out for themselves. Let's go back to, because <clears throat> um, I know your story or some of your story, uh, in your world of, of medicine in the, in the ER, that was, there was some, there was some epiphanies and turning points and kind of things you saw and started pondering, pondering on there that, may have been a helped send you in a direction yeah well actually there were two types of stories and things that I'll share from my time as a doctor the first was actually when I was um, uh, in general practice if you don't mind I'll go before no, totally. I was an emergency medicine doctor and actually just after my relationship broke up with my the mother of my children and and she was from Canada and she actually went back to Canada and we had a one-year-old and a three-year-old both in nappies and I ended up being a single father with a one-year-old and a three-year-old in nappies uh, and had the first six months completely on my own with them. And that was an astonishing experience. It was the most challenging and most beautiful time in my life. And in many ways, that really changed me because until that point, when I'd been with my wife, you know, I'd go to work and then on the way home, I could go to the gym or on a Saturday, I could go for a surf or I could, you know, I still had... A degree of independence once I was on my own for the first time in my life someone else was priority and more important than me and I had to be there for those boys I had to be there for my children and it it really brought out the mother in me and I started cooking and I started decorating their room and you know it's just a completely different experience and you know I have to say if every man had to spend six months with his young children while they're in nappies on his own, we would have a different world. And, and it really changed my medical practice as well. 
I started booking in one hour appointments one or tw once or twice a day. So instead of 10 or 15 minute appointments, I'd have one hour appointments with people and just talk to them. And the most interesting were the old ones, the old people, the elders. And they would come in and tell me, and it sounds very cliched, but they would say, listen, if I did it again, I definitely would have worked less. I would have spent more time with my family. I would have done the things that I really wanted to do. And that <laughs> really got hammered into me. And that was extraordinary. So that was the probably the biggest lesson I learned from general practice uh, from the elders. And then when I started working as an emergency medicine doctor, which I also really enjoyed because emergency medicine, especially in small rural towns like Mullumbimby, where I worked at the hospital, and you do a 24 hour shift and you still have to do general practice in the day. And if there was something happened at the hospital, you'd have to leave and go up there and deal with it. And then you'd, I'd spend the night sleeping at the hospital and looking after whoever came in. And then I'd go to work the next morning straight from the hospital. And it could be anything from someone with a sore finger to an earache to uh, something in their eye. And then someone brought in who's been run over by a tractor or had a chainsaw accident or a kid they've pulled out of a swimming pool. And, and I'd be on my own with, you know, some fabulously experienced you know, nurse, an older, an older woman who we would do incredible things and just try and keep people alive until we could get them somewhere or get a helicopter or get them in an ambulance to the base hospital. And that was extraordinary. And then one of the things I noticed, because I worked in a number of emergency departments around uh, the area, was a procession of teenagers. And I called it an over-representation of teenagers coming into the emergency department. And what I saw was with the boys, it often involved wheels, speed, jumping, you know, anything where you could do it fast, take off from the ground, whether it was on your scooter or your motorbike or your car or your skateboard. Um, and if you couldn't get wheels, they'd jump out of trees or just anything like that. And anything where there was the possibility of death or serious injury. And if they succeeded in whatever they were trying to do, the first thing they'd do then is go back and make it higher or harder or whatever. <laughs> and it could only end up in one way. They'd come and see me. Uncle Arno. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I noticed with the girls, it was actually different. I know these are generalizations, but this is what I was saying. That whereas the boys would go out there and do the craziest things they could do, the girls would sort of more internalize and then get into the stupidest, most dangerous situations they could get into. So they'd often drink or take drugs or something, and then they'd end up going off with a guy who they'd never met before, or getting in the wrong car, or, you know, and it was like, wow, it was terrible. And, you know, I also worked for many years at the hospital in Byron Bay while schoolies was on. And I, we would just see girls coming in who got drunk the night before did something they'd never done before with someone who they'd never met before and who they were probably never going to see again. And that would impact on the rest of their lives. And, and I'd say to these girls, you know, did you know before you did whatever it was that it was not a good idea? Did you know it was going to end badly? And most commonly, the girls would say, yes, they actually knew. They had a voice telling them it was not a good idea, but they would do it anyway. And that astonished me. And I'd say to the boys, you know, did you know that what you did was a not was not a good idea and was not going to end end well? And the boys would look at me and they'd go, "Nah, <laughs> we never even thought about it." <laughs> you know, they just saw glory. But you know, I was yeah. like, well, you know, what's going on here? And and then eventually I came to realize that they were looking for a way to initiate themselves. They were looking to step into the world of adults to do things that they're not allowed to do as children, but that adults do. But because there was no um, you know, facilitation or support or oversight, they, they didn't know how to manage it. It's like they've never had a drink. There's a bottle of whiskey or vodka. They drink the whole thing. That's what would happen. And I realized that, you know, Every child is gonna go through an initiation. Every child is gonna go through a rite of passage. And it really does come down to a question of, are we gonna create something that's healthy and supportive for them? Or do we let them do their own and then 
have to deal with the consequences. That <coughs> that's fascinating that the, the, the different genders kind of had, a, again, a generalised, you know, yeah, we did think about it and we knew it was wrong as opposed to the boys not. Is that, like, what's the essence of that? Is it that men don't think about it or they lie or... Or why why the, the difference in the in the genders sort of um, answer to that question? Look, I don't know whether it's been socialised that way or whether it's in that you know it's a whole big argument nature and nurture. You know they do talk about the frontal lobe not developing until the mid twenties, and you know with the boys, as I say, they, they they just see glory. They just see this opportunity to be a hero. You know, boys want to be a hero. Boys want to overcome challenges, conquests, all that sort of stuff. And so, you know, riding your motorbike and jumping over, you know, anything is become totally attractive. And they don't think about the consequences. That's the big thing. And there's lots of research around frontal lobe development. And with the girls, there are actually two things that would happen. One is they would hear this voice and they wouldn't listen to it. And the other is I would say to them, and what about your friends? Where, you, where were your friends? Were they not looking out for you? And once again, the answer was no. And so it was astonishing to me with girls that they're in these dangerous situations, whether it's at nightclubs or on the street or whatever, and they can easily end up on their own, intoxicated, not listening to their intuition. And that is a hugely dangerous combination. And actually then something else uh, really profound happened to me. And this is, we're talking 1992. Two, it was just after the marriage that I described um, broke up and I had six months with my sons on my own and then my wife came back from Canada and we started sharing the care of the children and I started seeing these notices stuck up on the wall about a men's gathering that was happening and then I read about it somewhere else and someone mentioned it I'm like right I'm going to go to this thing I've never been to a men's gathering so I'm like what was I 28 what, years old. <clears throat> Why did you go? What was the what was the impulse you had to go? Oh, just that I saw it from so many different places. So yeah, it just like it was like, you know, something going on. Why am I keep on seeing this thing? It's a sign, so to speak. I was probably at an age where, and I still am. I, I believe that when you get signs and because we get offered, there's so many different things we could do. How do we choose? And one of the ways I choose is if I sort of get it from lots of different areas, uh, which is a marketer's delight, I guess. But you know, there wasn't social media then. There were like posters stuck on the wall and it was in the local paper. Anyway, so I, I go to this gathering and I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going to be what it's going to be like and whether the other guys are going to have the same issues as me and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, cut a long story short. At this gathering, which was profound, it was only men. And, you know, we were told we're not allowed to talk about how much money we earn. We're not allowed to talk about sport. We're not allowed to talk about even what work we do. And it was literally the first part, no one's talking. And then we started getting into it and we had a, um, a, a, talking, a talking object. It was actually an old, a beautiful shell that had been carved. And only the person talking was allowed to speak and everyone just had to listen. And, and I, what I discovered was that basically all the men were struggling with the same five issues and pretty much every man had three, four, or five of those issues. And these were the issues that I uh, recognized. The first one was um, to do with their fathers, not having been recognized, acknowledged, or, or resolved whatever it is with their fathers. There's a major wound amongst men, a father wound. Um, so that was the first issue. The second issue for the men was, you know, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And, and I know what I'm doing is not what I really want to be doing, but what is it and how do I find what I really want to be doing? That was the second one. Uh, the third one was, when am I going to feel like I'm really a man? And by the way, there were men at this gathering from in their 20s right up into their 70s. You know, when am I going to feel like I'm a man rather than a boy in a man's body? Still with 12-year-old thoughts and stuff like that. The fourth, um, the fourth issue was, how do, I have a, how, do I, how do I be in a healthy relationship? How do I be in a relationship properly? 
you know, like I'm in a relationship, but it's bloody hard and there's things that really, you know, I know I make lots of mistakes and it's difficult. What does it mean? Because once again, no one's taught me how to actually be in relationship and, you know, everything that comes along with that. And then the, the fifth issue was for those men who were fathers, how do I be a good father? And even for those who weren't, who weren't fathers, but think about it, what does it mean to actually be a good father? And so those issues, um, uh, those five issues around father, what am I supposed to do with my life? Uh, when am I gonna feel like a man? Uh, how do I be a good father? And, um, healthy relationship. and how do I be in a healthy relationship? We were all struggling with those same issues. Mm -hmm. And I was, that was quite an insight for me. And it was at that gathering that I first heard the word rites of passage. And someone said, if there'd been something there for us when we were teenagers, our lives could have been, would have been very different. What uh, what differences did you make from that point on? Well, oh, the, the actually, before you answer that one, yeah, <coughs> who is, who put that on? Was it was it a was it a council thing? Was it in, was it a, a private you know, individual kind of did that? Yeah, there were three men: Rain Van Der Roet, Yarrow Starak, and John Allen, who organised it. It was called Standing Up Alive, mm. and it was at, um, out near the Channon, and. Uh, a number of those men decided to create a father and son program based on a you know as a rite of passage after that gathering and um, so a couple of things happened from that gathering first of all I discovered like a treasure trove of older men who I could go and talk to and I was just hungry for that and I would go and visit these different men and they would tell me stories and they would give me books and cassettes. That was the, day, the days of cassettes, which I'd listen to hungrily in my car, thousands of them and poems and, and mythological stories. And it was just like mind blowing, the, the information that I was kind of absorbing at this state. I was just like, oh my God, this is just extraordinary. And I started doing things like having fires out on my own on a full moon and you know, going walking out on the mountains and a few times I went for a surf on the full moon on my own out at one of the breaks. And, you know, I just started nude. exploring. Uh, I didn't usually surf nude um, at night on a full moon, but, you know, you could have. There you go. There's a challenge for you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, whether it's discovering the wild man, you know, I read Iron John and it was just, it was just a real um, a awakening to so many things. So... Yeah, that was something I discovered on this gathering. And then uh, we decided to run a, a you know, men and boys program and, uh, and they asked me to come along and I think partly because I was a doctor and it would give them a bit of respectability or safety or something. So I went on this three day program with 27 men and boys and something happened on that long weekend. Now it was not just a good weekend, it was a profound life changing event and sitting there hearing the stories of the men and seeing how the boys were just sitting there with their eyes wide open and the men talking about their own fathers and the relationship they had with their fathers and men crying in front of these boys because they had such unsatisfactory relationships with their fathers and talking about successes and failures and talking about relationships, talking about sex. You know, and these boys were just like hungry for all of this, it was, you know. It was, was their sons, right? Fathers, fathers and sons? Uh, not all, some of, some of them were uh, men, boys being you know, brought along by an uncle or a grandfather okay. or a family friend. Mm. Some with their fathers, it was a whole mix. And, and I just left that three day thing and thought, this is like, I'm so interested in, it. this is life changing. It was a life changing weekend. And that's when I started studying rites of passage in communities all around the world and discovered that every community everywhere would create a rite of passage for their boys when they were becoming young men and for their girls when they were becoming young women. And they all used the same basic stages, even though the, the community in Papua New Guinea had never met the community in New Zealand or Australia or South Africa or 
South America, North America, but they had thousands of generations of human behavior to observe, and they all worked out the same thing, that if you don't create something to create a transformation from boy to man, girl to woman, you're gonna end up with a community that's run by children, and that's a disaster. If they survive that period of jumping over big, big yeah, jumps yeah. and getting drunk and so on. Yeah, well, yeah. What, Which, <coughs> what are those stages? What, what, can you run us through them or some of them? Sure. What, what are the yeah, yeah. general? Sure, so th the first was recognizing that the, the person going through the rite of passage was you know, ready to change. And, and you know, with children, you see it. There's a point where they start changing and they speak to you differently and they're locking themselves in their room or you know, whatever. And that's an indication that they're ready to change. Uh, and so they would be, take the first stage is separation. So they're taken away from day-to-day -day life. So you can't create a rite of passage or an initiation, you know, at home, in the school, whatever. You get, you go to a place for it to happen. And then there's a transformation where you actually change. And we'll come back to that. And then there's a return or integration when you come back into the community at a different stage. So if a boy goes through a rite of passage, they'd be taken away, they go through a transformation, and they come back as a young man. And they are seen by the community as a young man, they have the privileges of a young man, but they also have the responsibilities of a young man. And when a woman comes back as a young woman, she's also seen and treated and you know, it's different. Being a young woman in a community is different from being a girl. So they're, they're the stages, a separation, a transformation, and a return. And these stages are well documented. And there was a Belgian anthropologist who had the job I would have liked. His name was Arnold van Gennep. And in the late 1800s, he traveled around to indigenous communities around the world, which would have been extraordinary because they were still living in that way. And he was the first person who recognized and named rites of passage. And it was a ritual way of creating a passage from one stage in life to the next. And my work in the last 25 years and what I've been most fascinated by is identifying what are the elements in the middle stage of the transformation. So you've got, you know, we take away a boy or a group of boys, we've got them out somewhere what do we have to do to actually create that transformation so that when they come back, they know, they understand, they feel inside that they are young men rather than boys. So that's what my work's been based on. <clears throat> I want to get back to that uh, no, transformation. That's the, that's, the, that's the trigger word to get back to it. Just go back to um, your observations in the ER and so on. Do you think that um, I mean, that was in the 90s? Was it late 90s you were seeing that? And 2000, <coughs> yeah. 2000s, yeah. okay, so that's 20 so years ago. Um, has that, um, that um, phenomena um, uh, got worse? And, and also, has it, uh, has it got worse over many years? Like, say, do you, do you feel or, un or know that, say, in the 1950s, <coughs> was there still... Um, that sort of lack of rite of passage or has there been a gradual decline and less and less and it's been it's now we're now at the point of like no one's getting any of that sort of stuff look I, mm, I think it's a bit of both like if if we speak to our parents or our grandparents they will all tell us that there was a period of time when they were in their teenagers when they did stupid things like they got themselves blind drunk or they had got their license and wrote their car off in the first week driving it as fast as they could or you know, it's it's not a new phenomenon, mm. um, and it, you know it's it's modified and certain things impact on it. But at the end of the day, children want to become adults, and, and they're looking and they're seeing the adults, and they want to do the things of adults. And if we try and stop them and hold them back, or just don't give them the opportunity, they'll go and they'll find a way to do it themselves. You know, I, I remember sneaking into my parents' alcohol cupboard when I was 12 years old and having a sip on, well, whatever night I'd have a sip on something different. I just want to try it. I just want to feel it. You know, and I, I didn't get blind drunk at that stage, but you know, I remember uh, I, was, I grew up when my parents would have dinner parties and they would, they would put a, 
a bowl of cigarettes on the table for the people who came to the dinner parties. That was what you did back then in the sort of the 70s. And my sister and I would steal some of the cigarettes and take the dog for a walk and go and smoke some Chip cigarettes away. in the bushes. You know, so it's, I think it is fundamentally innately necessary for this shift to happen. And if it's not created in a structured way, then people go and find it themselves. And that's what you see in gangs and that's what you see in frat houses and you see it happening in the, when people go into the army and you know, there's actually rites of passage are well uh, present in our society. Just unfortunately, so many of them are unhealthy. <clears throat> and there's no, the, what have you seen, and we'll get back to kind of your current school involvements, what um, where, do you see any of that in school in the school system at all? Is there any teaching of that? Is there any hint of acknowledging that there's a there is a period of life in, in in the youth's lives where this is necessary? Oh yeah, oh, look, I do. You know, especially the sort of the more progressive or um, and unfortunately, it's often the private schools because in the um, in the, a lot of the government schools in Australia, the teachers are just so overwhelmed, overworked. You know overnumbered by the huge populations that they're trying to deal with, that they see it. They, any school, I've been to hundreds of schools around Australia and around the world, will tell us that you know around about somewhere between year eight and 10, the kids just change. And there's, a, there's really, really difficult years. And that's when the, the kids are most at risk from, well, they're also at risk, most at risk from mental health issues and youth suicide peaks and, risk-taking behaviours and, you know, and, and there are some schools like Timbertop uh, from, uh, sorry, Geelong Grammar who started their Timbertop program back in the, in the 50s where though they, all of their year nines go for a whole year down to a, perfect, a, a purpose-built facility in the mountains and they spend a year down there and they have to chop their own wood to heat their water and they have to clean their dorms and they go out hiking and that, that is, and they're not allowed to see their parents, but they write them letters and that is all designed to create that transition from child to adult. And more and more schools uh, are doing that around the country and more and more schools are recognizing that this period of time can't just be ignored, it has to be addressed. In fact, there's a whole revolution starting to happen in our understanding of the necessity of creating healthy well-being programs for school children that include supporting this transitional process from child to young adult. Let's get to your, your work now then. <clears throat> the transformation, that middle bit, where so you 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 understood that that's a that's the bit that, that was I guess part of your purpose. Was that like a, a bit of an epiphany at the time? You were going yeah. medicine goodbye or yeah, well, so between 1993 and 2000, I would set up and create, and at the same time I was studying rites of passage all over the world and looking for similarities, or found similarities, and we would run one or two rites of passage programs here in the local area, and, and they were always profound. And um, uh, I was seeing that they, they changed people's lives, and I was seeing these boys in the years afterwards and I'd ask them how they were, I'd meet them in the street or at the beach and I'd ask them how they're going and they'd actually tell me. And um, I was also getting quite disillusioned with medicine uh, and stuff that I mentioned before about how economically based it is and how we just don't have enough time with our patients and how it's so much more about cure rather than prevention. And, and I also discovered that there were other men around Australia and women who were setting up rites of passage for boys and girls and so I started communicating with and bringing these men and women together. And in 2000, I made a decision to leave medicine. And I, and I had a practice in town and I spoke to my partner. I said, look, I'm going to leave. I want to do this rites of passage work and I want to set it up as a national organization. And we had a big talk about that and worked out the best way to do it. And I was very lucky that my partner was supportive of doing that. And I basically gave him the medical practice for almost nothing. So. Um, you know, it was a good deal for him, it was a good deal for me because I got my freedom. Uh, and I set up an organization called the Pathways Foundation 
and and we started running rites of passage around Australia and we created eight regions where we were running programs for boys and for girls and looking at trying to find ways to spread rites of passage into the mainstream by providing programs, by training more facilitators and also through a public awareness campaign where we would, you know, in any way that we could share about the necessity and appropriateness of doing this work. And then when you asked me about the transformation and my interest in, you know, what does it take, you know, to create a transformation so I can go with you and we can walk up a mountain and come back down again and say, well, that was a good walk. Or we can walk up that mountain and come back down and go, that was a life-changing transformational experience. And a rite of passage is supposed to be a transformational experience. And what I identified is there are a number of elements, but there are four key elements that we work with that make it transformational. And the first is the sharing of stories. So when we have the, the boys or the girls on a rite of passage uh, and they will, uh, you know, on, when we do them here, they come with a, a parent or a grandparent or a family friend. So it's, it's a multi-generational process. And the elders share their stories about when they were that age and about their successes and failures and about relationships and all sorts of things. And the, the young ones get to hear those stories. So we're not telling them how to live their lives we're sharing our stories and then they work it out themselves. So when we get men or women, but I'll talk about men for this one, when we get men talking about the relationship they have with their fathers, and most of them you know, talk about their sadness that their fathers were absent or, or were angry or, or were this or that or whatever. And then you ask the boys, you know, if you become a parent, what sort of father do you wanna be? How do you want your children to speak about you? And the answers that boys tell us are just, profoundly beautiful and you know that they've been listening so we, for the whole period of time we have different stories about different things in life a and then stories are a great way of passing on wisdom and knowledge they're also a, a very important way of building community which we think is a you know a key thing of the health and well-being of any person is to be in a community and and it's when we hear and connect with other people's stories that's when we create community so that's and also trust as well, because you know you're, all of you're spilling your guts about I don't know your relationship with your dad. That's a that's that's it's a know, big thing. Vulnerable. And yeah, and then there's a way to do stories well. So you have to set up a safe environment where there's confidentiality and only one person speaking at a time. And you know, so we we have become in the last nearly thirty years very good at setting up safe, uh, you know, responsible spaces for sharing stories which allows people to share and, and what we find with a lot of the adults and most of my work is with the men so that's I can talk more about them is that a lot of the men have never shared their stories and they're deeply personal stories that can't go way back to when they were teenagers and once they do start it's like it's a major event for the men and, and in fact I always say that when a child goes through their rite of passage and moves from child to young adult their parents also need to go through a rite of passage and they need, it's like we're all on a staircase and for the children to step up one step from child to adult, their parents also have to go up a step and let go and understand that, you know, that their, their young adult is now gonna have an independent life and they're not gonna know everything that goes on or control them and, and also the parents are now moving more towards eldership and, you know, it. In a, in a community, in a, in a traditional community, we are all on a staircase, and when a rite of passage happens, it's not just for one generation. The whole community is moving up the staircase together. So stories are the first aspect that are uh, involved. The second is creating challenges. What's an appropriate challenge uh, or, or deal for these young ones? Because if we don't create it, they're going to create their own as we've mm. talked about yeah. so creating challenges for them is the is the next one and there, there are many ways we can do that and i could talk about that for a whole nother hour uh what, what's what's one what's a, what's a kind of a bit of a go-to or a you know like a well it's interesting because when i looked at traditional communities often the challenge involved facing death 
or fear or pain, you know, all the things that I saw them doing in the emergency departments. Part of it, I think, for them these days is challenging them to think about what sort of adults they're going to be, what behaviours they know they need to let go of, and how are they going to be someone who's actually going to contribute to the world and leave it in a better place rather than just taking from the world. Because I think in the past, the biggest challenge might have been to get food or to you know, protect yourself from the, you know, the next tribe. I think the biggest challenge we face today is whether or not we're gonna destroy our planet. And so we need young ones who are gonna be involved in part of the solution. And then look, I've done programs where they have to go for a, you know, an overnight hike. It's a 24 hour hike or they spend solo time in the bush or um, yes, many, many different things that you can do. Um, so there's the challenge aspect. The third aspect is creating a vision for the future. Actually consciously spending time thinking about what sort of person do I want to become? What do I need to let go of if I'm going to become that person? A and sh sharing that vision. A and we know that if someone has a vision, uh, it's more likely to happen than if they don't have the vision. And it's, it's a really, um, healthy and positive thing to do to create a vision. And this is after the kids have been, you know, we take away their phones, we take away their watches, we take away those distractions, they're out in the bush, they're hearing stories, they're sitting around fires, they're in nature. And at a certain point, you know, they make a vision. And it's, I, I'm always just so delighted by what they actually decide and, you know, want to do and what, the, and how aware they are of the behaviors that don't serve them anymore. So that's the third element. And then the fourth element, which I really love, is based on this uh, belief system which comes from the indigenous communities that every child is different and every child has their own innate gifts, talent, genius, and spirit. And that our most important role as elders, teachers, parents, is to help the young ones, help anyone, but help the young ones recognize what are their gifts, what's their, what's their spirit, and that that is what we love about them, or one, you know, that we love them for who they are, and we want that to come out, you know, and that's their gift, and that, that gift is needed by the community. And so rather than, um, you know, basing life on aiming to have as much money as you can, or look a certain way, or all, you know, there's all this pressure for everyone to be like someone else, our thing is actually we want you to be you. We want you to find what you're passionate about, what you love, what you're naturally drawn to, and do that. Because there are people who, you know, there's, everyone's different. And, and when I talk about it being a gift, if we find their gifts, a gift is only a gift if you give it away. If you don't give it away, it's a possession. And we don't need more possessions in life. We need more gifts. So helping them find their gift <clears throat> is helping them contribute to the world. Correct, correct. Become, and, and look, it, it's, it's so interesting because it speaks to this thing about what's more important, the individual or the community, which is one of the major discussions. And, and for a long time it was about the community and now it's much more about the cult of individualism and everything like that. And, and I don't actually think it has to be one or the other. We need to look after our community. So we need to be community and our community is actually the whole world these days because of tech and globalization and everything. We're part of a global community. But what is the best thing that we can do for our community? It's actually give away our gifts. Mm -hmm. And how do we give away our gifts in the best way possible? It's by finding out what we really love, what we're passionate about, what we're best at and doing that. And when someone is doing what they love and what they're really passionate about, that's when they shine. And that's when they're most interested in, and you know, all, all these depressed people that we see, I think depression is actually a sickness of the soul. And, and if, if we haven't discovered our soul's purpose and we're lost and we're, they, you know, they talk about wandering in the wilderness or lost in the wilderness, when people are uh, in, a, in a negative space, they're more likely to make unhealthy life choices. 
Whereas when someone's doing what they love and they're really passionate about, they're actually more likely to make healthy life choices. Which brings back to this thing that I believe I'm still working as a doctor, except now I'm doing preventative medicine rather than curative medicine. And now I'm out of the system <laughs> rather mm. than in the system. But I know because I've been doing it for 28 years in over 25 countries around the world and we've had over 300,000 people come through our program. When you take people away into a loving, safe container, when you share stories, create challenges, make a vision and honor them, identify their gifts, talents, genius and spirit in, in all sorts of beautiful ways, that changes their lives, that transforms them. I know that because I've seen it time and time again. <clears throat> Just back to your, you know, the individual, it's a great sort of a, you know, thing to dwell, not that we have to dwell on it a lot now, but it, it is sort of that perpetual conversation, is it? You know, what's more important, individual, community? I don't, I agree. I don't think it's one or the other. It's actually both. And I've just spent a week out with some other wonderful families, and that was a topic of conversation. That, you know, in in our sort of world of of biodynamics and anthroposophical kind of um, conversations and context, is, you know, you're no good to the community unless you've sort of got your shit together as an individual. So yeah. you know, and, and and you have to be in some ways antisocial, and and go within and find those you know maybe you do help you 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 invite people to to help in this these processes to find your gift but then not to give it away and not to contribute you know to your community is is kind of it's only half the story isn't it yeah well the community should be looking after the individual mm. and the individual should be looking after the community and, and and this is where you know this whole transformation the first big rite of passage is really the transformation from child to adult and years ago I wrote a model on the difference between child behavior and healthy adult behavior and child behavior is what you typically see in a four to six year old um, and I know you've got a four and a half year old and, and at that age it's all about me I'm the center of the universe and I want <laughs> constant acknowledgement and I want someone to do everything for me you know I want a mother to be my servant and a father who'll be my hero or whatever it is and and you know, I can't handle my emotions. If I don't get what I want, I have a temper tantrum. When I'm tired, I get angry. You know, all of that stuff. That is typical child behavior. But healthy, and that's okay when they're four years old, but if they remain that way when they're adults, it's a major problem. And so healthy adult behavior is, you know, I'm not the center of the universe. I'm actually part of the community. And I know that what I do affects other people. And power is not just for me more power means i can actually do more good in my community and i can handle my emotions i'm allowed to be angry but i'm not allowed to swear at someone or hit them or be abusive i'm not looking for a mother to look after me all the time and a father to be a hero i'm actually looking for relationships and and when i first wrote this model it was not child to adult it was boy to man so boy behavior i'm the center of the universe i want constant acknowledgement i don't take responsibility for my actions I'm never wrong uh, I want all the power and I want a mother and I actually believe that we live in a world that's predominantly run by boys and they those boys that, yeah. are in the major positions of power and they can invade other countries and they can push buttons that can kill millions of people and, and if they're running companies and there's money they will happily or some of them will will happily take all that money for themselves and they will just destroy the planet for their own good whereas we need well men and adults who understand we have a much greater responsibility um, and, and when we don't do that first rite of passage as I say we, we end up in a world that's run by children mm. and, and and it's not only the shift from child to adult I've now extended the model child to adult to elder. And I think elder is as different from adult as adult is from child. And that we, it's, it's has a major impact on our communities when we don't have the elders in that true space of elder, where they just get older, but they don't become elders. And so, you know, the elder model is much more about 
I don't need to build an empire anymore. You know, I, I'm just happy to be who I am, to accept the fact that, you know, things are changing. And a lot of eldership is about mentoring the young and spending time, you know, where possible with the children. And it's not about right or wrong anymore. Um, and, you know, it's a different stage. And one of the best examples of eldership is when you get grandparents and grandchildren together. It's gold. In fact, they say that grandparents and grandchildren have a special bond because they have a common enemy. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I see it with my father who's 92 and, and he's really old and he hardly gets up off the couch now and he's in bed a lot of the time. When the grandchildren come around, he's out of bed, he's rolling around on the ground mm. with them, he's got things that he's collected that he wants to show them and, and the, the children get just unconditional love and they get seen. You know, he, he just tells them how fabulous and he can see their beautiful traits and it's so good for the kids. And my father, he gets energy, which is what he needs, and he has a purpose. And that also then frees up the adults in the middle to go out and do their great conquests. When you take the elders out of the equation, the parents are then having to juggle, looking after the kids, trying to work, trying to do their relationships, trying to do everything. It's hugely stressful. The kids end up spending way too much time on technology, which is the modern babysitter. And, you know, there's a reason why in many of the Asian communities, the grandparents were the predominant carers of the children. And, and still to this day, when we hear our stories, you know, on our camps of people about growing up, the ones who had strong relationships with their grandparents talk about it with so much love around how influential and incredibly important that relationship was for them growing up. It's fascinating, isn't it? <clears throat> I mean, I'm just thinking about now the use of the word elders. You know, we think elders in Australia, we think of our you know, indigenous um, traditional owners and, and elders is, is, is often referred to. Um, you do hear that in other cultures, but, you know, in terms of the, you know, white Anglo kind of, you know, there is, that word is just not associated, it's not associated with, with any, anyone. No, and, really? and in fact, there's a lot of shame about getting older. You know, men don't want to get older because they lose power and, and, you know, so there's a lot of older men who are still competing with their grown adult children and will actually hold them down in order to try and be successful and seem themselves. And, um, you know, no, who, who wants to get old because you sort of get kicked out and you become irrelevant and you're supposed to, you know, retire or whatever. So a lot of them end up going on the golf course or getting an RV and traveling around and you know, being absent. Um, or, and, or, or put into a home. Or put into out, a home. Out of the way. You know? Yeah, and, and women, when they hit whatever age it is, no one notices them anymore. And so everyone, men and women, on this staircase that I talked about, often, you know, the, the older ones are trying to stay down the staircase. Mm. And so there's plastic surgery to make me look like I'm on this step rather than that step where I actually am. And the men are trying to say, oh, I can still compete with this little punk. And, you know, and, and they put them down in, in all sorts of different ways. And it's like, instead of respecting elders, look, think about it once again. In the, in the Asian, in the indigenous, in lots of communities, the elders are the ones who get the most respect. Mm -hmm. In our communities, we give them the least respect. So why would anybody want to be an elder? I guess it also comes down to acceptance, acceptance of the individual that they are moving to the next level, you know, if they choose to, and if there's a support to do so, and the acceptance of the, 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 the not the lower, but the, you know, the, the generation, their, their, their children and so on, to sort of that oh, now dad or mum has moved to a different role. And That's then, right. And there's that sort of like, well, this is actually a wonderful opportunity to, you know, call it succession, call, I mean, it's just a, a nuclear family which we just don't have anymore. Sure, because the ultimate step on this staircase is stepping off the staircase into becoming an ancestor, which is death. And, and you know, it's the one that we treat so badly. Mm. You know, a doctor, I was a doctor for many years. When people die, we stick them in a special building, we pull a curtain around them, you know, we try and put it off for as long as we can instead of accepting that it's actually inevitable and can be done beautifully. And I saw death done so badly in hospitals. 
where people who hadn't spoken or, or fed themselves for six or 12 months are lying there and are in pain and have got bed sores and we're doing everything we can to keep them alive and they're miserable and, 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 and it's a painful death. And I've also seen death done really beautifully when it's accepted and the family's around and it's loving. And, you know, we, we, we are so afraid of it that we try and deny it. And, and so that, the both ends of the, of the staircase I talk about, if they're done badly, have a major impact on the staircase and sort of try and squash it all into this middle stage instead of having everything spread out properly and everyone being on the stair they're supposed to be on. Do you have um, a view on like post-death um, involvement in family? Post-death. Post-death. So the individual has... Uh, no, no, don't be sorry. Post-death involvement, does that mean a spiritual I'm just glad it happened, so I have an excuse just to touch that hairy chest of yours. Yes, yeah, so so post this, you know, because I've again been at a weekend, and you know whether it's sort of traditional owner kind of conversations, and or uh, and and or just people's point of view and their own experiences of of their ancestors who are um, who are still willing to help beyond the grave. Well, there's two things. There's one is how we deal with death after it happens, and and I've had quite a bit of death in my life in the last two years. So my mother passed away a bit under two years ago and I was very lucky to get the last month sitting in her hospital room basically holding her hand and because of COVID I couldn't travel I would have been in Europe otherwise and that was a beautiful experience to go through that with her and whilst it was very sad and painful it was also incredibly full of love and and after she died we actually did a traditional thing where we went to the home and we just sat for a week and and people would come and visit and bring food and you know and i was with my father and my brother and sister it was just extraordinary to have that time really sitting with it feeling into it being present to it and and mourning and doing all that but actually embracing the experience now, i've also seen people whose a parent dies on saturday and monday they're back at work mm. and then a year later it's coming out or they're angry or they're drinking or, or so I think there's a whole education around how we manage death and then there's a whole question about the spiritual side of death and I, I'm in a very unknowing I, I personally believe there is there's there's something but I, there's, I couldn't even come close to putting the words to it uh, and f my personal experience and I've done sort of quite a bit of work around uh, this side of death my my well one of my experiences was I went for a walk out in the forest here not long after my mother died and I was at a part of the forest which I, which I really love which has got these huge big trees and, and I, I was looking at these trees and how beautiful they are and everything on the ground and then I noticed oh there's a dead tree over here and there's another dead tree over there and there's dead trees lying on the ground and out of those dead trees new growth is coming and, and I realized that in nature life and death are completely living together and we don't separate them like we do or nature doesn't separate it like we do it's they're one and the same and i realized that everything on the ground which creates the, the the humus and the compost that everything grows from is actually dead matter and we actually need death for the new life to come through so that that was a profound uh experience for me uh, and then you know in terms of my mother for example i, I don't get dreams about her and I, she doesn't talk to me and all that but what has happened for me since she died is I've started doing the things that are inside me from her that she used to do so I've started baking her cakes and and getting great joy in fact I've got some cake I made yesterday I can give you a slice after this that, oh, that a bit was, dark. He didn't offer me one with that beautiful yeah, child. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it was her cake. And when yeah. I make it, yeah. my mother's there. And and, mm. and, and, and I realised I put all these orchids and plants in the front of, in a planter box in front of my sink, and I love them in, in the last year. And then I realised that's what my mum used to do. So, you know, in a way, part of how I stay connected with my mother and was not even a conscious decision is that that those parts of my mother that are inside me, I, I 
gladly, happily, you know, allow to come out. But I do think that there's a lot more to death, you know, which is a whole nother conversation. And then tragically, we lost a nephew um, under a year ago. We had a nephew took his own life. And that was a completely different experience because my mother was 89 and had a full life. But my nephew, who was in his 20s and had been troubled and had lots of struggles, but him taking his life was like a major seismic event through the whole family that was just, you know, how can this happen? How can a 21-year-old, sorry, he wasn't doing any as old, he was in his 20s, how can a, you know, a young man in his 20s take his life and the, and the pain that that's caused my brother and his wife that w- will never be resolved? You know, yes, they move on, but that, that, that pain will never go away. So, yeah complex and 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 painful and and i guess the final thing i'd say is that both when my mother died and when my nephew ollie took his life as well as all the incredible pain there was also incredible beauty and love and support and community that came around that was really quite extraordinary for all of us and it's i guess it's not so much a pity but it's it's often death that one needs to experience, not themselves, obviously, but family and close friends for, for, for that, um, uh, to experience that, isn't it? So, you know what? That just reminds me, because we often forget how important community and family is. Yeah. Know? And it's that point of death, it's like, that's, it's, there's no point to, your, yeah. p- you know, point to your time, is there? Well, they say that rites of passage are a community event and they are regenerative for the community. So it's like they feed the community. So when a boy or a girl goes through their rite rite of passage, when they come back, the whole community will be there and that will feed the community. And a marriage is a rite of passage. You move from being single to being in a, you know, you're wedded and everything that goes along with that. And that is a, that is regenerative for the community. And there are a number of, you know, quite a lot of rites of passage and then death it's also a rite of passage. You move from being an elder or, or alive to becoming an ancestor. And the whole community comes around for the funeral and the whole service which goes on with that. And even though there's lots of sadness and grief and everything, they're regenerative events. After my mother passed, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, people who I hadn't seen since I was a teenager or in my 20s came and visited and we reconnected and we're still connected. and. And, you know, we had all these people coming over who used to work with my mother and father 20, 30, 40 years ago. And it was extraordinary and definitely a regenerative process, even though the regeneration was caused by the passing of my mother. Well, there's the, you know, the life and the death, isn't it? <coughs> yeah. You know, the death, you know, fosters and is a catalyst for, for you know, a, a better life through better connection. I was just thinking as well, you know, there's the rites of passage is a form of succession, isn't it? You know, and what is that word? It's success. You know, so the, the success, and there's lots of definitions for success, and there's you know, put let's put aside the, yeah, you know, business de- definition of success, but you know, a successful family, if I can use that, is one that is succeeding, and is there's that succession of generations through, you know, which again, <coughs> you know, we have lost, and there's you know, I. I'm sure we all know a lot of people who have you might what might say a dysfunctional family because there's just that's a just lot not yeah and the, it, the, the succession the succession doesn't happen that the father tries to hold on to power for too long the mother tries to hold on to you know control and knowing everything for too long the kids try and break out of it you know and i'm now working with families who are trying to create healthy successions because if they don't you know, the family breaks down. And so one of the places to be creating rites of passage, one of the healthiest places is within families. And then passing on that that knowledge, that power, all of that. And then the elders can actually be elders. And and the ones in the middle get their chance at, you know, having a go at life and, and the young, you know, move through a, a healthy structure that supports them. And, and with our lack of healthy rites of passage at the moment, 
we just see this major dysfunction happening at all levels of society. Have you done much work with farming families and succession? Uh, not a lot, but I have done some, and it's the classic place where, you know, at what point does the, does the old farmer, you know, actually pass on the farm or the knowledge or the running of the farm? And you just see that, uh, you know, some do it well and, and, and are grooming their children from a young age, whereas others are trying to hold on to power for too, for too long and, and um, you know, as we know, it doesn't work well. <clears throat> no, and, and I was very lucky in my experience. My father and family, um, that was not a problem. Um, but I do know many people, and I often bring it up in conversations with, um, you know, on the podcast, and just you know, it just happens in, in the farming world where we know, understand a lot of families have go through that. Mm. And it's a, it's a real tragedy. It's probably the one of the most, you know, there's financial stress attached to it, but and, and there's financial stress in a business from season and so on, but the the financial stress um, of, 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 a, of a failed succession plan is horrendous. The motion, the, the, you know, the physical, I mean, there's plenty of people who've, you know, taken their lives because of, because of it just hasn't worked. Yeah. You know, they haven't got through it. You know, whether yeah. it, and there could be any, any, any generation in that, the, the young or the old, and, 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 and um, children suing parents and parents suing children. And it's, I think it's, the, again, the pointy end of, a lot of this is because there is a an asset. There is a, you know, the property, the life, the business is the, it's the one thing, and so there there is nothing else. Well, they might have a, you know, shack down the beach or something, but generally, that's that's what's being um, uh, haggled over, or the opportunity to 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 um, for succession to take place, and it's and it's you know, and, and sons stay on, and sisters go away, and then they come back 20 years and go, where's my part of the farm? And the son's going, hang on, I've, I've just put 20 years of my life in this. You, you know, what do you think? You should just get one third, one third, and me keep a third. You know, that is just, and I don't know, maybe it happens in the world of, you know, other worlds, you know. Happens no, everywhere. Yeah. Happens but, but everywhere. I guess with with assets, you know, like, like literally the house, like say it's a, um, a I guess it could be in any business. I, you know, mum and dad got a printing business and the kids come along and like, who's going to get the printing business? And I guess it's not much different, is it? No, and, and, and it's actually something that should be thought of well ahead of time. Oh. You know, it, it's, that's about having a good structure and a, and a healthy family um, communication strategy. And, you know, th there's no doubt it can be done well and what you're describing is about when it's done badly. And it, when it's done badly, as you say, it breaks up families. Mm. It destroys families. And, and that is, that's a tragedy. So I reckon, off, I mean, we're gonna chat offline about farming stuff. I've got something that I reckon is of interest to you, maybe. Um, what was my other bit there? Um, oh, so tell me. Oh, well, I'll, I'll just jump in there. I did a, had a lovely time with um, your. I don't know if you were there because you busy, busy man. A couple of years ago, Lilla and I um, came to one of your rites of passage weekends, and, and Lilla was. Um, I think she was about nine. She's eleven now, uh, nearly twelve, and so I reckon she's nine or ten. Down here um, with I think there were eleven other dads and daughters. And we, we turned up on a Saturday morning and then we left on the Sunday lunchtime, I think it was, just after lunch. And I have to say, it was life-changing for me and Lilla. Like, Lilla the, you know, the question everyone asked at the end is, like, you want to come back next year? You betcha. Um, and then it was COVID, I think, so that didn't happen. But it was such a wonderful experience. And so thank you for, I guess, providing the forum and the opportunity for fathers to take their daughters to such a weekend. And, you know, the steps we went through and the... I mean, in some ways, it was a rite of passage. Um, you know, they weren't 14, 15, 16. However, there was, there was a kind of relationship rite of passage. You know, that, like, you know, dad's crying and, 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 and kids telling stories and, and just expressing that, that, that exercise in the, in the TP at the end where, you know, the fathers would, with, the, with their daughter on their lap, just, just tell them how much they loved them and what they meant to them. And I can't remember quite what that what the question was there, but I tell you what, there was no bloody dry eyes in the in the in the whole thing, and it was just a we just and it, it occurred to me that weekend is like why the hell haven't I done this earlier? Why the hell aren't isn't this just part of being a parent? 
Um, and I kind of knowing you and our conversations, I know why it's just not part of culture anymore. But it was it's a it's a real tragedy. It is, and, and our aim is to get this into the mainstream again. And you know, we're now working in lots of schools and, and trying to bring it in because, you know, it, it's just, you know, basic stuff that is, as you say, life changing. And, and, and we have we've developed actually a program called Transformational Education, which has three pillars. And the first is building healthy communities and you build healthy communities by sharing stories and hearing the stories of others. That's one of the ways. So building healthy communities teaching our kids critical 21st century life skills, which they need, like resilience and emotional intelligence and relationship management, um, stuff like that. And the third is creating healthy rites of passage for them, rather than letting them go out and create their own unhealthy and potentially disastrous rites of passage. And, and, and you know, we're finding that schools are more and more interested in well, partially or very much driven by the parents who for the first time are saying, we are, we are as interested in the well-being of our children as we are in their academic results. Whereas when I grew up, it was purely about academic results. So, um, you know, we're, we're working with schools who, it's a, it's a business thing for schools. They're recognizing that, you know, this is what parents will decide on where they send their children is, the wellbeing program. So, when those wellbeing programs include um, building communities, teaching key life skills, and healthy rites of passage, it becomes something that actually differentiates a school and genuinely supports the development of the children within the school. So, you're approaching schools. You said before you, you, you're. I mean, I guess there's individual schools, but then there's kind of the next um, layer up of, of governance or kind of education structure there. Yeah. That, I mean. To, so getting your program into any and every school would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, you know, the, the number one thing for children is their sense of belonging. And there's a shift. So when they're young, their sense of belonging comes from their family. And then around about 12, 13, 14, it shifts. And instead of the family being the most important, their peers, their friends become the most important. And if they are not in a healthy group, they would rather belong to an unhealthy group the no group at all. And so we have to be creating these healthy communities, which actually also include the involvement of parents from a young age, not waiting until they're teenagers. And I always say you can't start raising a teenager once they become a teenager. And, and, and if we know all of our children are going to go through a rite of passage, do, do we want them to go through that rite of passage when they're drunk and on drugs in Byron Bay with no parent within a thousand miles or kilometres? Or do we want to go, okay, how can we create a really healthy rite of, pass rite of passage for these children that really sets them up for the future? Anna, I'm conscious of the time, the, lo the, the light's dimming. I do want to do a little quick, very quick Q&A with you after we we'll cut this off. We have a Patreon membership that um, uh, supports us every month and we give them special special um, content. Bon you're, you're the, you'll are you be the bonus content. You ever been bonus content before? Oh, I, I don't Anna? think I have, so. You sure? <laughs> well, you will. You will soon. But before we leave um, this one, can you just let us know um, where people can find more out, m more about your your work, um, get in touch with you? Um, you know. Sure. Our, our website, the Rites of Passage Institute, right spelt R-I-T-E-S, Rites of Passage Institute. And we run programs for children from 7 to 17 uh, with their parents, all sorts of different programs that are on there. We do leadership training for people who are interested in learning about the Rite of Passage framework, and that's a three-day program which I facilitate and which I love, and we run those around Australia and internationally. And um, uh, we also um, have books and, and talks and YouTube channel and different things uh, on that site. So anybody who's interested, please check out our um, website, the Rites of Passage Institute. And The Making of Men is um, one of your, how many books have you written? I've written one and I have yeah. another book sort of in the, uh, in the wings. Yeah, under a pile of papers somewhere that I'm <laughs> trying to get to. But also the other thing actually we're very passionate about is bringing our transformational education program into schools, mm. which we're finding more and more schools are interested in and 
hopefully that's something that's really going to spread over the next few years. So what you so if anyone listening could actually get some info from the website and approach their school and say, hey, take a look at this. Yeah, and they can approach yeah. us and we'll send them information that they can take to their school. Yeah, cool. Uh, let's wrap it up. Isn't it incredible? The phone here is like it's nice, like sucking light out of somewhere because it's actually quite dark in here. I know it's extraordinary. Yeah, the modern technology. Um, Anna, that has been such a lovely chat. It's been a couple of years in the making because of for different reasons. But w since we met some years ago, um, I've always been fascinated, and I really appreciate what the work you're doing because it is it's it's essential um, as a parent um, and as a community member. I think that you know. Uh, and our chat now is even just it's just cemented that even more that uh, how important the um, the rites of passage concept and and for that to be part of our culture any culture um it's it's uh it's essential so mate thank you for your work and um and anyone listening please jump on the website um and suss it out we'll have links in the show notes and everything for those books and and uh, his website and so on too so check it out there or just jump on you're all smart enough to google and stuff Thanks, or duck, Charlie. Duck, or duck, duck, go. Use duck, duck, go. That's another good one. That's another conversation. Thanks, Anna. We'll um, we'll catch anyone who wants to be a Patreon member already is in the next little quick Q and A. It's a rapid fire. It won't take long. Great. I'm up for it. Thanks, Thanks Anna. Charlie. Awesome. Pleasure.